go. Have you ever seen this show before? I can't watch it because it's just like too true to life to me. So uh, I obviously understood everything that he just said. Um, so if, if any of you see me walking around just like, like looking like this, it's because I understand everything you're saying. <laughs> Uh, no hablo español para mierda. Okay. <laughs> so, my mom's gonna be very ashamed that I said that on stage. Okay. So, uh, I need to, you all to imagine yourselves, transport yourselves far, far away to the magical place known as the Silicon Valley. It's not that magical, but just pretend for a second. Okay? Today I want you all to be venture capitalists with me. So I need all of you to put on your finest Patagonia vest. Strap on your Allbirds, because I don't know why, but they all wear them. And, and most importantly, you must be wearing a vest, because apparently everyone wears a vest in Silicon Valley. Okay. So you are all venture capitalists here, and I'm going to be presenting to you my, my idea. I'm going to be pitching you right now. So here we see one of our friends on her brand new iPhone XXXL. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she's a, she's a working lady. She needs to get from one place to the other. And so she immediately needs a helicopter. Okay, so on her, she's going to request that. She's somewhere in the middle of Medellin, or she could be in the jungle, or she could be in the desert. I don't know, right? But it needs, our app needs to work in all of these various different places. So this is what we're doing. We're building Uber for helicopters, right? This sounds extremely useful. Everyone's going to use it. It makes total sense, right? So it needs to work on iPhones, obviously. It also needs to work on old Android phones. And it probably needs to work on flip phones too, right? Because people with flip phones need he helicopters. And as soon as you're done with your plane, your game is Snake. You probably need to request a helicopter after that as well. And most importantly, it has to work on Windows Phone. So, who's ready to fund my company? No hands. You're smart people. <laughs> I, I gave this talk in Prague, and people are like raising their hands, like, no, put your hands down. It's a terrible idea. Why? That's, why is it such a terrible idea? Because people on flip phones don't, don't need helicopters, right? If you have a helicopter or you have enough money to request a helicopter, you probably don't have a flip phone or a Windows phone. <laughs> I gotta be careful who hears that. I might get fired. Okay. <laughs> Secondly, here's my okay, next idea. Next idea here is we're gonna build an e-commerce website and we're gonna target India as our target audience and it's only gonna work on the latest iPhones. Who's ready to fund that idea? Now that's a terrible idea too, because iPhone has like no penetration in India, right? So why would we be building that for that? So why am I painting this like weird picture for you? It's because you need to know your audience when you're building these applications, right? So that's the name of this talk is 10 kilobytes or bust to so the delicate power of Webpack and Babel. Um, I work for a tiny startup called Microsoft, if you might have heard of it. <laughs> We're kind of in stealth mode right now. Uh, no, so I'm Brian Holt. Uh, I'm a cloud advocate. Uh, for Azure, for Microsoft, and I did this little thing called Front and Happy Hour. We, we, you just get really drunk and talk about JavaScript. It's, it's pretty fun. Uh, also, the do Front and Masters, like she mentioned. I think you mentioned that. Again, I'm working on my Spanish. <laughs> Enough to say shit on stage. Okay. Uh, I worked at these other tiny startups. Again, you might have heard of them. And I have, I have a confession. I actually have a favorite Colombian, and it's this guy. <laughs> so, I'm a big Juventus fan, so, so I was cheering for Colombia in the World Cup because my team didn't make it. <laughs> so I'm originally from Utah. I currently live in Seattle, which is there on the right. Uh, and this is my puppy. No, normally this is just to get people to pay attention to what I'm talking about. I was like, oh, puppies. Okay, cool. So I have to admit, 
after the like the last thing that we just saw, that like amazing performance, this is going to be kind of a letdown. So just prepare yourself for that. <laughs> but okay, so I put this tweet on up here, and it's I, with uh, with some hesitation that I put this tweet up here because I both agree with it and I hate it. Right? I hate it because. It's kind of an asshole sort of way to put these things, right? That these sites are best viewed with a high net worth. They're kind of implying that only if you have a nice phone or a nice laptop can you actually see these web pages. I agree that the web is for everyone and we should be making websites to you know, fit everyone's need, but like, we're trying our best, damn it, right? No one's going into work, it's like, I'm gonna screw poor people today, right? <laughs> Maybe you do, but you, you would be an asshole, right? <laughs> No, we go in there and we're just trying to survive, right? We're just trying to ship the features so that the company doesn't go under and or we don't get fired, right? So uh, what I'm going to try and do today is I'm trying to give you a bunch of tips and tricks and all that kind of stuff so that you can accomplish your day job and still work on like lower power devices, low um, latency network kind of stuff or high latency networks. So, th like that being said, like not every app needs to work on 2G networks. Uh, Uber for helicopters, you're probably okay only working on 4G, right? Because you're not requesting a helicopter in the middle of the Sahara. I mean, that would be nice, that'd be a nice feature, but uh, it doesn't have to. So this comes down to know your audience. So you, as web developers, I hope you look at your analytics, right? whether that's Google, Google Analytics or App Insights or something like that, I hope you're looking at the Google Analytics to figure out how fast of network they have, what kind of devices, what kind of operating systems, so on and so forth. So you kind of have to figure out what your demographic is, who you're targeting, what you, what you want to do with them. And most of you, or some of you, don't have to work on 2G, but today we're gonna talk about 2G and low power devices because that's what I know how to deal with. So I wanna get some numbers in front of you, right? 2G is 14 kilobits per second. 3G CDMA, which is what Verizon uses in the United States, similar to GSM, uh, 144 kilobits per second. 4G LTE, 100 kilobits per second and gigabit fiber, which I just got in Seattle and I'm very pleased about, uh, is a million kilobits per second, right? So that's, that's a pretty wide difference here. Like I've had 3G the entire time I'm here, so like the internet here is plenty fast, right? Uh, but if you're targeting people on 2G, you kind of have to use some different techniques, right? Like how many of you used to browse the internet on that? I did, right? Do you remember its sweet song as it like reached out to the internet and connected? Yeah, this guy knows what I'm talking about. I'm not gonna do the impression, it would be horrifying. <laughs> so, yeah. Remember browsing the net on this? 2G is slower than that, right? So that's 56 kilobits per second. I was browsing the internet on that 20 years ago, something like that. No longer, it's been, yeah, it's like 25 years ago. So, yeah, I remember like leaving my computer on overnight to download video games, which my dad was furious about. And uh, that took, yeah, it took forever to do that kind of stuff. So what, people browsing on their phone and 2G in, you know, India, in Kenya, and even like the middle of the United States, right? Like where I'm from, Montana, they, they don't really have 3G, it's just 2G, right? So it's actually worse now if you think about it because back then they were designing websites for this, right? They were designing websites for these super slow internet connections. Now, like Netflix or whatever, right? We're shipping to you like two megabytes of, of code that takes a little bit while to download it. And like if, if you're on a slow connection, you're just gonna bounce, right? So I wanna do a bit of an experiment with you. I need everyone to put their phones down, close their laptops. I will shame you if I see you. <laughs> and I'm going to make you watch LinkedIn load on 2G. Okay, you ready? Everyone, buckle up. Okay, I'm gonna start it now. You might wanna get comfortable, you're gonna be here a while. <laughs> so you can see up there, it is going, right? 
So let's see, how far into this are we? I can't even tell, right? So we are in, yeah, way too much time here. So we've been here like for 30 seconds and nothing has happened, right? How many think your users are gonna stick this out? Oh, we got a loading spinner. <laughs> you let the users know, it's like, okay, I think, I think something's happening. We're probably in what, like 45 seconds now? Still loading spitter. Oh, we see something. We can see my face, <laughs> but like no actual useful content yet. Like this is insane, right? How many think any of your users are going to stick this out, right? You're going to have like a 99% bounce rate. Still going. Okay. So now we're actually starting to get some like real content and images are loading. Like this is not a good experience, right? Still loading by the way, it's still loading stuff underneath the fold here and there. So that was after about 90 seconds that took that page lo to load, right? This is LinkedIn. LinkedIn has 17,000 employees. I, I, I show you this because I used to work there, right? So I, can, I, I was part of this problem here. <laughs> And to be fair, LinkedIn has other strategies for 2G networks. I just wanted to make an extreme example here. You wouldn't be loading the desktop experience uh, on 2G, or I really hope not, right? But I want to contrast this with this. This is Tribo.com. It's a discount motel chain in India, okay? So same speed and everything, right? I'm going to start pressing, I'm going to, Press load starting now. It's pretty much like you have a first meaningful paint within about a quarter second, and within about four seconds, you have pretty much everything above the fold rendered, and then within 12 seconds, it's totally done, right? Which is a better experience, right? The one from this massive American tech company or this one from this Indian uh, company, right? So if this is a competition, Bangalore is kicking San Francisco's peach, right? Like it's just not even a competition. So hopefully at this point, my goal here was to make you feel bad, right? How many of you are sitting there like, oh man, I'm like, I'm, I suck at this, right? <laughs> Every time I give this talk, I was like, yeah, I, I got shit to do too, so. <laughs> so this is kind of how I feel when I start like going into this, right? It's like I feel like I'm just floating through space, not really knowing what to do, right? Kind of wish I was there right now, actually. So over the like the next you know couple minutes here, I'm gonna just give you a bunch of tips and tricks and stuff that you can do to kind of get started on making your website a little bit more lean, a little bit more fast. Various different techniques here. Some of them will be like, go do this right now, no matter what. Some of these will be like, hey, change your entire application, right? So it's gonna be varying levels of difficulty here. So first one is question your framework, right? Like I've I use React, right? So I'm like down there towards the bottom, right? But if you're using React and React DOM, just out of the box, even just before you've done anything else, you've already had a one second page load, right? That sucks, right? I haven't written any code yet and my page already takes a, a, a second to load. And, and like Angular is even worse, right? It's two seconds. Like, and I'm not trying to shame these frameworks. They're fantastic frameworks that do fantastic things for you, right? But if you're trying to reach people uh, in, on 2G networks, you really can't use Angular, right? It's, it's just too slow. Vue is getting better, and then Preact is kind of right now the gold standard, right? Preact, you can get 0.1 seconds just for your framework. That's probably an acceptable cost, right? Next one here is, uh, I'm, I assume most of you are using Babel right now, right? If you are using Babel preset ES 2015, go change it right now. Like, just, just get up and leave, go to work, and change it, right? So this is done, this is deprecated, no one should use this at all anymore, and you should be using Babel preset env, right? The, the one I'm showing here is for Babel 7, there's one for Babel 6, if you're still on Babel 6 as well. You should have created a Babel 7 too, but that's not a slide in this, okay? Uh, the reason being is Babel preset ES 2015 will compile all of your code for old browsers all the time, with, like unexceptionally, right? Whereas as browsers kind of catch up and they adopt more and more features, we want to transpile less and less of our code, right? We want to 
just be transpiling the bare minimum to, to reach most of our users, right? That'll get your bundle size down, it'll make your app smaller, so in general, a really good thing for you to, to get on here. This is a novel technique, one that I haven't actually implemented in production, but I, LinkedIn was trying it a little bit. So we're familiar with ES6 modules, right? Uh, there's a new browser feature. You can actually load ES6 modules, or ESM modules, rather. ESM modules. Anyway, whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so you can load just uh, new code using the type equals module. Old browsers won't download that. Only new browsers will download that. So if it's a new enough browser to support that, you'll only get the new code. And then you'll have one underneath it. And there's a blog post from Chris Baxter on this if you want to read it. Uh, that will download the old code if, it, if the first one's not available. So that's uh, one technique that you can also do to just transpile less of your code. Tree shaking, this is kind of a fun one. So this code right here, got two lines of code basically, right? Lodash, most of us have probably seen or used Lodash before. So those two lines of code get you a bundle size of 73.3 kilobytes. That's neat, right? <laughs> it's a great application you have right there, right? <laughs> um, yeah, that sucks. So that's not gzipped, right? It's just, uh, it's just, uh, it's just like minified and concatenated. Um, so what's the problem here? Well, how big is Lodash? How many methods does Lodash have? It's like 200-ish. Does anyone here think that they use all of Lodash's methods? No, no, good. This is a good crowd. No one raises their hand for stupid questions. <laughs> okay, no, no, like no, Lodash has like 200 methods. We don't use all of them, so why, why would you include it all every single time? Well, there's a method called tree shaking that we can only bring in the things that we need and leave all the other stuff behind. So this would be an example of a um, Babel uh, configuration here. So the key line I want you to look at here is the module's false part. So this is telling Babel's like, leave, leave the modules alone. We'll get Webpack or Rollup or whatever com uh, compiler you're using uh, to not include that stuff. So if we change this code to import get from lodash dash es, which is the package that packages it with ESM modules, right? Then we can get that down to just 11.1 .1 kilobytes. And like, how much more work did I end up doing? Like, not very much. So just to show you an example of that, this is the first code, the, or rather this is the one I just showed you. This is this code right here, right? It's not that much code, right? I mean, there's a decent amount that goes into like Lodash, and uh, so that's what you see like the, all the various internal modules here. <laughs> But if you include everything, it looks like that, right? It's a pretty stark difference there. So this is why you want to use uh, the tree shaking. Something else here that I wanted to point out, how many of you have done line five there? This is with M, right? So last two versions. That's bad. <laughs> this is, used to be what you were supposed to do because you're like, oh, I want to only target the last two major releases, right? I only want to target like Chrome, you know, latest version of Chrome, latest version of Firefox, latest version of Safari. The problem with last two versions here is you're also going to target the last two versions of Internet Explorer. <laughs> like, let me tell you, having worked there, Internet Explorer is a nightmare, <laughs> right? So you, you don't want to be targeting Internet Explorer 9. That, that just makes zero sense. Okay, so actually what I want you to do here is I want you to, to not do this, and I want you to do this. So this is going to be 0.25% of global users, right? And you also don't want to target dead browsers. Like Internet Explorer is a dead browser because we're not developing it anymore, right? So this will also save you a bunch of space. It'll make your app faster pretty much for free, okay? So tree, sh tree shaking is no silver bullet. It's a bullet, that's what it's called, and then I made it silver. Okay, I thought it was funnier than that, but screw you guys. <laughs> so it's not a silver bullet because um, 
you can't like really tree shake React, for example, right? Like React uses all of its internal code. So if you try and like eliminate dead code out of React, it doesn't work, right? There's no dead code in there. It's also not really gonna make that much of a difference in your application, right? Because hopefully you're not shipping dead code. Maybe you are. Don't. Don't ship dead code. <laughs> that, that should be a slide in there, just don't ship dead code. Okay. Use built-ins. This is another one that, uh, this is pretty new. I think it's with Babel 7. So use built-ins and then that colon usage. This, so this would go in your uh, Babel configuration file. And what's really cool about this one is you have, like say you're using promises and the, and the environments that you were deploying code to didn't support promises, right? So down there you have import core-js modules, like that's actually what it gets transpiled to. So it actually is only including the polyfills that you need, which is fantastic, right? If you don't do it this way, then you get all of the polyfills all of the time, which sucks because native promises are faster than the polyfills of promises. And you also don't need to ship that code to people that don't need it, right? So that's what use built-ins does, is it only brings in code that you actually need. So that's another one that you should definitely check out, particularly from Babel 7. I think this is new to Babel 7, so it doesn't work with Babel 6. Loose mode, however, loose mode's been around forever. So I don't, don't bother reading the code here, but the one on the left is loose mode, or so the one on the left is a strict mode a compilation of classes for JavaScript, right? Like, they're complicated things. Classes are complicated things, and if you, you don't really need all of the different corner cases, and like, what happens if you have a class with a symbol? Like, most of us are not doing crazy stuff like that, right? The one on the right is the loose mode implementation, which is what gets you like 99.99% .99 of use cases, right? So you don't actually need the strict mode here. It's, it's fine to just have the loose mode. I've been doing this for years, and it has not bit me in the ass yet. Knock on wood. Okay, this, is, this one, especially if you're using React, just build using Node M, Node M equals production. If you don't do this, it means you're shipping the, the development build of React, which is four times bigger and like 10 times slower, okay? So just make sure, again, it's one of those things like just open my laptop, it's like, wait, are we building with Node M equals, okay, good, okay. Uh, Slack famously didn't do this for a long time, so Slack was just being slow for no, no good reason at all. Code splitting. So in order to get your application down to 10 kilobytes, which is the name of the talk, right, you have to do code splitting, which is the idea that you load some bare bones JavaScript first before you load everything else, right? Like those people at Trebo, right, they're not going to load all of their JavaScript at once, they're going to wait until they actually need that JavaScript. So that's what code splitting is going to do for you. Is it going to allow you to have that smaller bundle up front and then load the other like pages or modules or modals or all that kind of stuff when you need them. So the easiest place to split code is obviously on routes, right? So if I'm going from route A to route B to route C, you can load each one of those routes individually, right? But you can also split on things like a modal, right? If I click on a modal, then load the modal, right? You can also split on any sort of modules that you don't necessarily need until later. Make sure you are splitting a decent amount of code. If you're only splitting out like three kilobytes, who cares, right? So you need to be splitting out more things like 15, 30, 20 kilobytes of code before it actually becomes uh, useful to you. If you want like an extra pro tip on there, or uh, have a service worker go download all the bundles in the background so that it, you load the first thing, it renders the first render, and then you have your service worker go download the rest of the JavaScript files. That's cool, we should definitely do that. Don't include source maps in production. Like don't, that, like that's just an easy one for you. Make sure you're not doing that. Don't include inline source maps. That's going to like quadruple the size of your bundle. Scope hoisting, this is popularized by Rollup, but now it's actually built into Webpack. This is actually not gonna make your code a whole lot smaller, but it is going to make it faster. So you see line four there on the left, that's that webpack require method, it's not free. In fact, it's actually pretty expensive. So actually by inlining the helper there like we do on the right, it actually makes that code run significantly faster. So uh, now you just get it for free. It's, it's just built into webpack. You used to have to configure webpack to do that. Uh, but make sure you're on like webpack four or later or else you're not getting that. Keep your libraries up to date. I think that's kind of a theme for this particular talk. 
Image skeletons, these are kind of fun. This is more about like psychological wins because obviously you're loading more stuff in the end, but you're making the user feel like the website is faster, and like half of this game is just a psychology game. You want them to feel like stuff is happening, right? So we're using SVGs to approximate what images look like. So you can see there on the right, that's the full image. Maybe that's like, you know, 500 kilobits or, or kilobytes or something like that. This SVG on the left is using 10 shapes to approximate what that image looks like. I think that's like, it's bytes. I don't think it's even a kilobyte, which is really cool, right? So you can load that immediately. You can inline it, and then you can wait for the other thing to load in the background, right? That's pretty cool because the user immediately sees something. They feel like something's happening, and then as they're kind of scrolling down, those things will kind of populate. So those are super easy to auto-generate. Uh, I think this one's pretty cool as well. So this person actually went and hand drew SVGs with like the outlines. It's kind of hard to see these outlines here, but you can. Um, so it loads those SVGs first, and then it loads the image on top of it. Or this one's one of my personal favorite. SVGs are super easy to animate, right? So you can actually have like the SVG animate in, and hopefully by the end of the animation, you've loaded the image, and you can just like push it behind it. You get this really cool effect. And here's a bunch of other ones that I've seen social networks use. Just put nothing there in like a box so they know that something's going to be there. Do a placeholder. You can sample the, the most common color on there and put that on there. Or Facebook often, I, I've noticed, oft, often does like the blur up, right? They put like a blurry version of it that's like one kilobyte and then they'll um, put that on there. So I took a big project and I just uh, stripped out all of the images. This was like the total bundle size. And I was able to shave off like two megabytes of stuff just by using on the initial page load, just by using <laughs> these sorts of techniques. So one thing to keep in mind is like 100 kilobytes of image is not the same as 100 kilobytes of JavaScript. JavaScript is way more expensive because you have to parse it, execute it, all that kind of stuff, whereas browsers are very good at loading kilobytes. So make sure you keep the, those things separate in your brain. So. Here's kind of the, the TLDR of this whole thing, is try and get your initial page load under 10 kilobytes, depending on your framework, right? You have to be using pretty much Preact to get there. Um, invest time into your build. It, that pays dividends to make sure that your build is, is really working, your infrastructure works really well. Uh, make sure you're only loading the bare styles, right, with CSS, if you can do that, like inline critical CSS, that's usually a good thing to do. Load everything in the background, use code splitting, use image skeletons where appropriate. Um, yeah, and just make sure you delay everything that's not critical until after the first page load. Uh, I'm gonna give you some, just some pro tips really quick, particularly with functions. I'm gonna talk about this in terms of Azure Functions, but this works with Lambdas or Google Functions as well. Um, you can see more about how to deploy functions really easily with that link down there. Um, so th ideally, we're gonna re reduce time to first byte Time, uh, server timings is going to be something really helpful. You can actually send down a header that lets you know what your backend is doing, so you can see those things inside of like Chrome or Firefox. So you can see there uh, where I have the red box. You can see like my SQL is taking this long, the cache is taking this long. That's cool because you get to yell at your backend developer and say, "Hey, fix your shit." <laughs> uh, compress your responses. So when I started working at one of the companies that I used to work for, I'm not going to shame them on stage, though I already shamed them earlier. <laughs> uh, they weren't gzipping their API responses. Like, that's, that's a no-brainer. You should always gzip your API responses. That's just free web performance. Obviously, this is exaggerated, right? You're not going to go from 73 kilobytes to 241 bytes, but you can see it can be a drastic difference. Look at Brotley compression, if you can. Uh, it's getting more and more supported. In fact, I think almost every browser today is supporting Brotly. So that's different than gzip, right? It takes longer to zip something, which is usually fine because that's done at compile time. So that's something to be aware of. It'll make your build take longer. But uh, it significantly can cause some more savings over gzipping. And you can see here the support for it's pretty good. So check out Brotly if you can. Cold start's really tough because if you have like really crazy dependencies, uh, it can, the node resolution system is actually quite slow. Usually you don't notice that because that happens all at startup and you don't have to notice after that, but something to keep in mind. But we have something called Azure Function Pack, which is a f uh, fork of Webpack that will actually get you uh, most of the way there. It'll actually inline all of that so that node can just run it. So the, 
kind of to wrap it up here, um, helicopters. <laughs> this is what I keep coming back to, right? So if you're building Uber for helicopters, go ahead and ignore 2G, like focus on the audience that you're really trying to get right because you're trying to like survive at the end of the day, right? But just also keep in mind that if you're building things like LinkedIn, like I was, LinkedIn is for everyone, right? Everyone needs to get a job, everyone needs to get it connected to someone else, right? So that's on us, or was on me, I'm not there anymore, so screw those guys. <laughs> But it's, it's on us to like try and reach everyone, right? Because it's not just for uh, people that can attend conferences and people that are web developers. It's for everyone everywhere. So th th that's my invitation to you is like follow your ethical duty to try and reach everyone that you possibly can. Thank you.